Hello, hello. All right. Chapter 7, Early Polyphony. Western music has one distinctive characteristic, polyphony. By contrast, Chinese music, Indian music, Korean music, Japanese, all of these venerable uh, music traditions have enormously intricate melodies, one filled, ones filled with subtle microtones not present in the melodies of the West. Similarly, sub-Saharan African music employs rhythms so complex as to make those of the Westerners use, um, look childish by comparison. But for music making, with s many simultaneously sa with many simultaneously sounding pitches, polyphony, no musical tradition is richer than that of the West. To be sure, Western classical music has cultivated polyphony, expressed both in harmony and counterpoint, to a degree unknown in m other musical cultures. One consequence of this can be seen, for example, in the colossal orchestra orchestral scores of Gustav Mahler and Richard Strauss. But how, when, and where did this Western obsession with polyphony begin? Perhaps polyphony began with uh, individuals singing in different vocal ranges. Um, when individuals singing in different vocal ranges noticed their harmoniously different sounds and began to cultivate them. Perhaps it was, perhaps it began when people singing the same tune in slightly different ways created poly polyphonic intervals from time to time, or perhaps. Polyphony emerged from when a s group sing in a round and enjoy the resulting poly polyphonic sound. Obviously, we do not know where or why uh, polyphony first appeared, but very likely singing polyphony is as innate as human, human expression as singing itself. All right, organum in music theory sources. What we do know is that the first documented appearance of polyphony mu uh, of polyphonic music comes from the Benedictine Abbey, comes from a be Bene Benedictine Abbey in northwestern Germany, and dates back in eighteen um, in the eight hundreds in the eight nineties. It is found in a music theory um, treatise entitled Musica in Curiatis Music Handbook that describes a type of polyphonic singing called organum. Soon the term organum, plural organa, came to be used generally to connote polyphony. As one theorist explained, polyphony is called organum because voices singing in harmony show a resemblance to the instrument that is called the organ. Ah. The author of Musica Incriadis um, identified as Abbot Hoger, um, date 906, in the earliest sources, did not address his, his discussion of organum to composers, nor did it, he intend for the music theorists to, who wished to analyze music. Instead, Abbot Hoger's sole aim is to teach s church singers how to improvise polyphono polyphonic music on the spot, to take a given piece of Gregorian chant and make it sound more splendid by uh, adding one or more additional lines around it. This sort of improvised polyphony, po polyphony would <coughs> this type of improvised polyphony would be cultivated in the Western churches for nearly a thousand years, up to the time of French Revolution. Thus, the music, the musica, and incriadis, incriadis and other similar treaties taught musicians not the rules of composition, but a technique for improvising music ext extempore, so for improvisation. Okay. Exactly how did this work? Most organum described in the music uh -huh. in the music in Curiatis is parallel organum, organum w in which all voices move in lockstep, up or down, with the intervals between voices remaining the same. Parallel organum. So that's where they're the same. Same intervals. Moving in harmony. In its most basic form, parallel organum proceeds with only two parts. One called the voice, by the vox principalis, the principal voice, and is a pre-existing chant to be enhanced. The other, the vox organalis, the organal voice, is the new newly created line to be added to the chant. The intervals at which the two voices proceed, not surprisingly, are the primary consonances of the early Middle Ages, the octave, the fifth, and the fourth. 
Musica Encriadis allows for a parallel organum at either the fourth or fifth below the plain song. Thus, the vox organalis always moves along. Um, always moves along the vo voice um, principalis at the interval either a fourth or fifth below. What is more, both voices may be doubled an octave b above or below. Thus, four voice parallel organism organum is also permissible. So, singing in parallel fourths or fifth often results in a dissonant tritone, as when F and B sound together. To avoid this uh, tritone, the author of Musica in Creatus urges the organal voice to remain stationary at those potentially dangerous moments. Um, the organal voice would normally start on D in a parallel organum at the fourth, but here it starts on G as to not create a B, F, B tritone while the principal voice is rises through B. So it'll stay on G. More than a century passes before we um, before we find further discussions of polyph um, polyphony. They appear in the writings of two music theorists in the 11th century, Guido of Arezzo and uh, John of St. Gall, both of whom we have previously, previously met. Guido introduced the musical staff with pitch letter names as well as a system of hexachords and a musical hand that facilitated sight singing. John was the first to expound... Um, a complete system for the eight church modes that we s we and as we know them today. Ah. In his micro in his micrologus, yeah, that's in 1030, Guido devotes the last 19 chapters to polyphony. He does not advocate a four voice organum, only a two voice organum, and the voice and the vox organalis usually a fourth below. He too was concerned about avoiding the offensive tritone. He avoids, or he advocates, parallel organum whenever possible, but where a tritone might lurk, it should be avoided by means of oblique motion. Guido was the first theorist to be concerned about cadence, which he also, which he called the ocursus, ocursus, um, a running together. Ah, ocursus. So that's about cadence. John of St. Gall devotes only one chapter of his De Musica, written in um, 1100, to organum, but he has two important things to say. One, contrary motion and voice crossing in organum are to be encouraged, and two, voice principalis, the chant, should appear beneath, not above the or voice organalis. So hereafter, the from the late 11th through the 16th century, the given Gor Gregorian chant is placed towards the bottom of the musical tr uh, texture as voices are added around it. The, uh, the old chant serves as a scaffold supporting the newly added voices. Cool. Organum in practical sources. Our best information about early polyphony comes from the music theorists who were intent on instructing their medieval singers on how to improvise organum around a given chant. But com contemporary manuscripts survive that contain written polyphony as well. The earliest of these comes from Benic Benedictine Monastery in Winchester, England, and it dates in 1000 CE. The collection is called the Winchester tro Troper because it contains mainly tropes. A trope is a chant manuscript mainly preserving um, auditions to the liturgy called tropes. The Winchester tropes date to um, some 30 years before the invention of the musical staff, and its pitches are written in unheightened unhe neumes. Moreover, the two-voice polyphony is not notated in one manuscript. Since the singers already knew the chant by memory, only the newly composed voice was notated in the Winchester troper. Consequently, because the notation does not specify relative pitch, and because the two voices are not placed one on top of the other in the same book, it is impossible today to sing the music without any co with any confidence. All we can say from the Winchester Troper singers is that singers can ge um, generate a repertory of about 150 two-voice organa, Kyries and Alleluias for the Mass um, example, for example, 
um, the Winchester Troper was not clearly a prescription document or pres prescriptive document for sight reading, but a memory aid. The singers had all of this organ in, in their heads and just needed a reminder from time to time. In contrast, um, let's see. In contrast to the notational uncertainty of the Winchester Troper, the next significant collection of organum can be read with great clarity. Surviving today from nor southern France is a repertory of 65 pieces of two-voice organum. It is called Aquitian, Aquitanian polyphony because many of the words come from various monasteries in the region of Aquitania. Aquitani, Aquitani, in southern France. Most, most are trope sequences and a later fo musical form called the conductus. Um, all pieces date from the 12th century. Fortunately, with the Aquitanian repertory, we can read pitches with no difficulty. Yet rhythm still poses a problem, and notation seems to seems not to uh, imply rhythm durations. We can transcribe the notes as a series of eighth note, f eight notes, for example. But the music was most likely performed um, ex tempore. Ex One singer, the bottom voice, simply held and waited for the other top part to sing the more complex line. Indeed, many Aquitanian pieces exemplify passages of what is called sustained tone organum. The bottom voice holds a note while the faster moving top voice embellishes it in a floral fashion, florid fashion. In Aquitanian polyphony, sustained, to sustained tone organum must often occur, most often occurs at the cadence points at the end of the musical lines. So one voice stays still, the other one moves around the top of it. Um, yeah, it's Aquitanian. A fine example of Aquitanian polyphony is the anonymous two-voice Verderunt Emmanuel, and it is a two-voice trope of the gradual of the Mass for Christmas. Verduent omnis, um, yeah, and it would have been sung in a monastery on Christmas morning. The bottom voice begins like a gradual chant, um, Verduent omnis while the top voice is newly composed. Intervals of thirds and sixths are plentiful in the music in the mid middle of the phrases, but more constant um fifths and octaves are always sound at the beginning and the ends. Always sound at the beginning and the ends. And se several points several endpoints from the bottom voice holds the top of holds while the top voice ca um, cascades a full octave down from the scale to form a final cadence a clear instance of sustained tone organum. Aquitanian polyphony gives the distinct impression of being music that is rhythmically free, luxuriant, and even sensual. There is little that is prescribed in the written scores other than the pitches, and the ultimate effect for of a performance demanded greatly upon the tempo, rhythms, and nuances of the singers that the singers chose to employ. Cool. All right. Related to the repertory of the Aquitanian polyphony is a small collection of some 20 pieces preserved at the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela, Spain. Next to Rome, the pilgrimage site of the greatest importan of importance of the medieval Europe was the ca Cathedral of Santiago, for it was believed to house the relics, the bones of the Apostle James. It was so important was it that a grand street in Paris and was and still is called Rue Saint Jacques. Jacques. And each year along this road, thousands of pilgrims went south on their way to Paris, walking toward Compostela in the northern western Spain. It is estimated that 500,000 pilgrims took this and various other routes to Compost Compostela annually. Thousands still do today, sleeping in monasteries and hotels youth co hostels along the way. Surviving today at the Church of St. James in Compostela is a manuscript called the Codex Calixtinus, written around 1150 and once believed to be the work of Pope Calixtus II. 
It contains a service for St. James, which also includes 20 poly polyphonic pieces, mostly for Mass and Vespers. Once again, the musical di notation does not suggest rhythms, only relative pitches. The singers must fit the two parts together as a spirit and the meter of the text move them. The Codex Calixtinus is important um, is an important monument in the history of Western music because it is the first manuscript to ascribe composers' names to particular pieces. Among the composers named in the manuscript is Master Albertus of Paris. To him, to him is attributed one of the earliest three voice compositions of Western music, Congagiant Catholicy, Let the Faithful Rejoice, um, the beginning of which is given below. The master Albertus did, in fact, exist. <laughs> he was the cantor of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris in the mid-12th century. Thus, it is to Paris all and all of the so-called Notre Dame s school that we turn now, that we now turn. So, the summary of that. The first discussions of polyphony in any musical culture appear in Northwestern Eus Europe in the 19th century. In the 9th century. Um, early polyphony is called organum, and our knowledge of it comes from two types of sources. Theory um, treatises and music manuscripts. The treatises begin by emphasizing parallel organum, but increasingly come to recognize the need for oblique and contrary motion to avoid the dissonant tritone. Ah. Organum, unlike monophonic chant, was not an everyday affair. Singers wishing to adorn, um, to adorn the, the liturgy in a special way employed it to the highest feast days of the church year. In all early organum, England, Span, uh, Fran France, and Spain, the general tendency was to assign polyphony to those chants traditionally sung by soloists, such as tropes and difficult uh, responsorial chants. Simple, sim, sim, simple syllabic chants, um, such as p psalms and hymns, continued to be sung chorally and monophonically um, in monophonic Gregorian chant. The largest collections of written organum are found in the Winchester Troper, in 1000 CE, which contains about 150 pieces that cannot accurately be deciphered, and a 12th century repertory of medieval Aquitaine, southern Fr uh, south southwestern France, which includes 65 compositions, some in sustained tone florid style. The Codex Calin Calixtinus, a manuscript preserved at the pilgrimage church of St. James in Compelis in Compostela, Spain, contains 20 examples of organum dating about 1150, and it is a source to ascribe compositions to particular composers. That's chapter 7. Now we're on chapter 8. Cool. Medieval, our music in medieval Paris, polyphony at Notre Dame. Today, Paris is breathtaking, arguably the most beautiful, sophisticated, and visually stunning city in the world, but it was not always this way. At the time of the c collapse of the Roman Empire, around 5th century CE, Paris was home to no more than a thousand souls huddled on an island, the Ile de la City, so city, island, <laughs> in the middle of the Seine River. The early Me Merovingian kings ruled 500 to 751, made Paris their first city, but the Holy Roman Empire um, Charlemagne, the founder of Carolinian uh, dynasty, moved his capital to Aachen in Aachen, Aachen in western Germany around 790. When Charlemagne died in 1840, 1814, he left gifts to the 21 most important cities in his empire: um, Rome, Milan, Cologne, and even Arles. But uh, nothing. In to insignificant Paris. Forgotten Paris declined even further. It was not only until the 10th century upon the extinction of the Carolinian line and the ascent of the new dynasty French of uh, French kings, the Capetians, did the center of government return to Paris. Two centuries later, the city experienced, experienced a renaissance. During the 12th century, a new style of architecture emerged in Paris and surrounding territories, one that replaced the older, heavy, Roman-dominated Romanesque style. 
Today we call this new lighter manner Gothic architecture. But contemporaries call it Opus Fragsens Fraseinum, the work in the French style. Churches in cities near Paris and in Paris itself were built or rebuilt in the new Gothic style. In the main, in the main, these were urban cathedrals, but rural, not rural, monasteries. As the new church steeples reached towards the heavens, they signified an rising urban power. Also in the 12th century, education moved the m from the monastery to the cathedral, from the country to the city. In Paris, church schools appeared next to the, c the cathedral and eventually spilled over into the south left bank of the Seine River. Here, theologians uh, taught the seven liberal arts so that the clerical um, students might read and correctly interpret the scriptures. Spellbinding teachers such as Peter Albillard, uh, 1079 to 1142, attracted thousands of students ac from across the length and breadth of Europe. In 12 tw 1215, a university was recognized by the Pope, Universitas Magistorum et Scholarum, the University of Masters and Scholars, as it was called. Soon overrun by students, the population of Paris swelled from 285,000 in the 12th century to 80,000 mid-13th to nearly 200,000, according to the census of 1329. Wow. Paris had become the largest and most important city in northern Europe. So the Notre Dame of Paris. Oh. At the center of it all, uh, geographically and spiritually, was Notre Dame. Like most cathedrals in France, the one in Paris was dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary of Our Lady Notre Dame. Typically, the m the most typical of most gotho um, Gothic cathedrals, the campaign to construct Notre Dame took more than a century. Um, the church we see today was begun around 1163, but not finished until more than a hundred years later. Today, 800 years after the fact, we have been accustomed to the size and beauty of Notre Dame, standing, standing 10 stories tall, around um, 108 feet. In the Middle Ages, however, visitors to Paris were stunned. The Notre Dame towered over the surrounding buildings like um, Colossus. A vision of the House of the Lord, celestial Jerus Jerusalem, had been placed on earth, indeed in the very center of the city. By far the largest building any major medieval city was the cathedral. The western end of the church was called the Nav, N-A-V-E, and this was the public part of the church. People came out, people came and went as they pleased. Goods and services were brought and sold. Pilgrims slept on the floor. Preachers preached. Heralds made the public announcements. The nave functioned as the town hall and the civic auditorium. It contained within all contained within the west end of the Lord's Temple, but where were the musicians? Ah. Most music was made in the east end of the church, in the area called the choir, which included a high altar. The, in fact, the name for this part of the church was derived from the group of singers, Latin chorus, um, that performed therein. The clergy of as many as a hundred at a time sat in stalls divided in half. Half sat in the north side, of the choir aisle, half on the south, six to eight boys or choir boys accompanied, occupied, six to eight choir boys occupied benches on the floor. Every one, the full clerical community, sang the basic Gregorian chant, for solos in the Greg, I, for solos in the chant, and the for singing polyphony. However, specials were needed. At Notre Dame, this more professional choir of specifically trained singers numbered about a dozen. When the soloists performed polyphony, they stepped down from their choir stall, from their choir stalls, and gathered around a single lectern in the center of the choir. Here they sang the organum made famous through Europe by the composers of Notre Dame, Leoninus, and the Magnus Liber organi. Right. Among many students drawn to the University of Paris in the late 13th century was an Englishman 
with a particular music and interest, with a particular interest in music. After his studies in Paris, he he returned to England and wrote a music theory. Hey, 